Hi there, everyone. My name is Jennifer Bewersi, and we're gonna have one of our artist chats today with the lead artist for our sound film this month, Sound House, Everyone is Working. Um, so I'm gonna invite them, and then we'll get started. Perfect. Oh, hello, everyone. Hey, Jamie. Hi. Hey. It's so nice to see the four of you. Thanks for making some time to talk about your beautiful project, Sound House. I thought I would start by just kind of setting the stage a little bit. Um, so uh, we got the opportunity to, um, ex we're gonna get the opportunity to present Soundhouse as a film. Soundhouse is a kind of performance installation that involves puppetry and sound and performance. Um, and the three of you are the lead creators. So um, I was wondering if we could start um, this is such an interesting interdisciplinary collaboration that you guys have created across um, disciplines that don't always get to spend so much time like co-creating together. So I was wondering if you could talk about like how this project started and what its path was and, and like how you've woven your disciplines together. Um, John, do you want to start or Janie or Cassia? Uh -huh. Well, I, I think I think John Cassia initiated the, the very initial conversation. So maybe. Sure, let's do that. Cassia, sure, I mean, start it out. it's hard to take credit at this point, honestly, for anything because I feel as though we've been so kind of co-working for so many years now. Um, but in the beginning, uh, Janie had a show she was running called Fugitive Time that she had created and she designed everything for, and I was brought in at the end to work on some sound design. And I was just really taken with her process and how her pieces come together and the sort of the, the scope of, of how she puts together these. Um, and I'm talking about you in the third person, Janie, you're sitting right here with me. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Happy to be in the third person. Okay, but I just, I, I, um, I kind of got to be sort of on the outside looking in and I was I figuring out how my sound could, could work with what she had already created. And I was realizing that she had these structurally she was thinking about her puppetry and video pieces in the similar way that I was thinking about how I make music and how I make my sound pieces. And I know that um, John and I were working together on some other things. And then I brought him in to help with more of the technical aspects. So then of course, I, I really love his creative voice too. So that became like all integrated. And then I thought, well, what would it be like if we started a piece from zero together? Because in this, scenario of Fugitive Time, it was um, a show that was under development, it was already kind of in full swing. But Janie has a way of working where she leaves a lot of space for other people's ideas. And it really, really enriches the work. And so I thought, well, you know, could we the three of us come up with something that was similar in structure? So then, yeah, we, we just sort of agreed to meet like actually right here, back in the olden <laughs> days, when people used to get together. Um, <laughs> we're that old. <laughs> well, how so. has the project been going on and, and what have been some of the iterations of it? Well, um, I guess to, to, we must have met in maybe 2016. Do you think, I think the, piece, right. the, the piece was in 2015, Fugitive Time. So mm -hmm. we had an assignment, which was that each of us was to come to our meeting with one idea. Mm. You know, not a million ideas, one thing that they wanted to bring to the group. And so we all met and we each had something to bring. And um, what I brought was a, a story that I had read recently um, by Donald Bartolome that was about the people who work underground in the missile silos. And it sort of described their daily routines. And it was a fiction piece, so then it ended kind of, you know, with a fiction type dramatic ending. But it, it I've always been sort of obsessed with that Cold War era. And so I did a lot of research about the actual routines of them. Anyway, I brought in that story. And then mm -hmm. John and Cassia each brought in something which they should describe. And then we can sort of talk about how it went from there. John, how about you describe yours first? Well, I guess I, just as a slight precursor to that, um, bring up that like our, our real initial interest in working together in this way was to come with the, the various media that we work with and everything and have some kind of performance situation where they're all kind of driving each other and not um, 
a lot of, you know, normal formats that are great have kind of one thing leading the other because that's how a lot of things end up working. Um, but we really wanted to, because for a lot of the reasons Cassie mentioned in the way um, our experience of Janie's work had been, we felt like there were the, all these kind of subtle ways that the different things we do might interact. Um, and I, th I think that was really like outside of the, all, the, all the stuff that came after that, which is important, um, was driven by this idea that we wanted to have a situation where video, puppetry, sound, all these things would would interact in a way and drive each other and not and, and one thing would be weeding the, the right. whole time. It was non-hierarchical. Um, right. And we, we wanted yeah. everything to be able to interact, but also to exist apart when it needed to. Right. right. So, so if I'm understanding this right, like in maybe a typical film, they would have like the story, which would be first and the visuals, which would be second and the sound fully, which would be third and the sound score, which might be fourth or whatever order. It's more of like, they're constantly triggering each other. Is that, is that right? Accurate? And, and, and even though I brought in a story, I wasn't interested in us doing that story. I was interested in that world and the tasks that the people per perform daily. Yes. Beautiful. Well, could maybe one of you describe, so there's a lot going on in this piece as you've kind of like hinted at, and it's one of the like beautiful features, this kind of um, tending and, and layers of busyness. So could one of maybe you describe the basic kind of elements that, that you're working with in Soundhouse? Sure. And, and maybe I mean, Cassie could, could could start by talking about sure. what she said on that first meeting. Oh, that's yes, also that's right. really important what she brought in. <laughs> Thanks, Janie. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we so the the, the sort of fundamental foundational elements of the piece are well bricks are, are one of the things, and that's one of the things I brought in was I did not bring a bunch of bricks to the meeting. I'm not that person, <laughs> not yet, but. <laughs> <laughs> that came later. Um, I brought um, like videos of um, these sort of professional bricklayers or these competitive bricklayers. And then I went to the library and I checked out some books that showed sort of brick patterns that people can lay. And I was really interested in those patterns. And then we were seeing how that could sort of fit in with the tasks. So, um, so anyhow, the, fun, the foundational elements of these of this piece, we have people, two performers, who are laying bricks. And that is kind of a layer that runs consistently throughout the show. And in fact, they are somewhat independent. When we talk about, like, one thing driving another, driving another, they kind of just run consistently throughout. Um, and then we have another layer, which is um, eight walls that we had designed and built by Vincent Richards, right? Is that his last name, Jamie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And he, um, we told him everything we wanted them to do, but then he made them beautiful and functional and actually work. And so the uh, walls have these electronic components inside that to sort of simplify, they, they talk to one another. And so John and John can send them codes and information. And so we have these eight walls that are sounding and being distributed throughout the space. And then of course we have the puppets, which everyone loves because um, it's, it's, I think it's the most intense of the tasks or maybe one of the more intense tasks. We have three puppeteers um, per puppet. So there's six performers who are tending solely to these puppets and um, helping them act out these, again, these tasks. So I think those are basically the layers. It's quite possible I've forgotten one because honestly, when you've had a project for this long, um, it gets it kind of grows and grows and grows and in, in complexity <laughs> well there's um one thing i remember of it is there's like a there's a lot of video aspects to it too like so there's some correct me if i say anything incorrectly but there's some live manipulation into an overhead projector that's then being processed with other video that's being projected and then janie you also are like live videoing the performance Right. That's also being projected. So there's this kind of system of surveilling and processing and reprocessing. Well, well one sorry? of the images that we came upon pretty early, and I think you brought this in first, uh, Cassia, was an image of the JPL, like looking down into the work area of the JPL. And it was sort of shockingly like what we were thinking about. All these people are going about these tasks 
and and the floor had different circles and squares on it to define the space and and they were working together but sort of separately and so um yeah that was one of the other kind of structural things of this like a nasa workroom nasa um lab room where you'd also see the video monitors of things that are happening far away or close up and so bringing in that element of the live yeah work live work live surveillance um and then also video that's coming from somewhere else that you don't know and the the video of the various monitors in the space that are monitoring the activity yeah yeah so i want to talk specifically about this idea of like monitoring and tending but before we move on i want um john maybe you could talk some about what you know we talked about these signals being sent to the walls can you talk about like what's happening with sound in the walls in the space yeah for sure and I, and I wanted to just interject one kind of quick summarizing thing about some of the stuff that Jeannie and Cassie were talking about just that we we all had like these this strong interest in these various kind of task performance and then you know Jeannie mentioned the story that she brought in about the missile men which was a really nice setting for a lot of the different things we had talked about in terms of like very serious tasks that as you can you know associate with that kind of situation and then also totally innocuous like idle tasks like things to keep yourself entertained or whatever and that i think that was our like initial step into this world that kind of became like and it and it was a more innocent time then too like <laughs> pre like 2016 <laughs> where we were like thinking about this stuff and then it kind of became took on a slightly different meaning um but we were really taken with this kind of situation of doing very serious work and watching that and also all these kinds of smaller things that you do and um, that brought the various things we were interested in together really nicely and one of my initial interests was in kind of having a structural a physically a physical structure of these walls and with speakers and microphones where we would literally be kind of sculpting using the acoustics and and interacting with those by using wall positions putting microphones um on the puppets to kind of have this dynamic um soundscape that was a literal reflection of what was happening in the piece um which you know is really evocative of a missile silo as well not that that was like our express purpose but so that it kind of evolved into this really nice system, which took a while to get to, but, um, and Eric Heath was a big part of designing that initial system with um, um, a bunch of microcomputers um, on a wireless network all being kind of controlled in um, interactive ways. And so the resulting sounds are a combination of these kind of feedback components, recordings that were taken a lot, Cassie took a lot of recordings like out in the desert where a lot of um these kinds of structures are live and mm -hmm. and then kind of these uh um synthesized tones that are um we have various different kind of sound codes that are used to communicate things about how the, which part of the structure gets shown when so cassie and i have a a big job in certain parts of the piece where we are constructing parts of the silo um with these walls according to sound codes that are being transmitted and the walls, just to kind of say it and for people who haven't seen it, so it's these, I would say like three by three walls ish somewhere. I think they're like three and a half high. by three and a half. Perfect. So, <laughs> good estimate on my part. I know, I was kind of impressed. Kind of waist height, and they're on casters, so they can be rolled and reorganized over and over again. And they have speakers in kind of the center of the box that right. are emitting sound are they also do they also have microphones in the walls or is it just speakers in the walls just there's speakers and uh and ultrasonic sound sensors which are used to detect movement the microphones are in the puppets puppets right yeah. okay and there's this kind of whole dance of signaling each other you two as performers and the walls are signaling you and then also the puppets and the puppets respond to the walls in certain ways. So part of this mesh you've created of responsivity, does that sound, is that fair? Right. <laughs> cool. 
they're really I, they're really magical. I, I think it's important to say there's no other sound that all of the sound comes from the elements in the space as they interact with each other. That is important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's, actually, there's no like sound design, if you will, that's right. a PA that's playing. Right. That sort of makes it different than a um, a theater production right. um, in and certain it's ways. Full, full of chance, uh, what happens, but also th there's some programming where John is selecting certain kinds of tones. Am I correct, John? That a certain section might have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the puppets are doing some of the programming. Well, the puppets <laughs> are. But you tell them, you you let them know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> very interconnected and like it sounds like a uh, part a feature of that interconnectivity is like a kind of contingency that like they you know things both cause and react in a way that's predictable but not mapped out in a in a repeatable way is that right. true yeah yes yeah that's that's accurate i mean it's 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 kind of i mean i had this feeling when we did our our performance that the sound film is based on or was shot at the same location at UC Irvine, um, where the, like the process of setting up and tearing down Soundhouse is Soundhouse, you know, like all the tasks we, like we carefully <laughs> lay this paper on the ground and then, you know, John was on his hands and knees, like measuring out this very specific blueprint with a pencil and, and a square. And you I mean, I'm, we were all doing everything. And then we had to load in the bricks and then get the walls and then all electronics to get going. And I was thinking that, you know, like we're going to be presenting, you know, like a 20 minute sound film for Music for Your Inbox. But also there's a version of this that's a week long installation somewhere where people can walk above the gallery and watch us set up the entire thing and, and do it and then break it down again. And it's all it's really hard to tell when the performance aspect has begun and when it stops. I mean, it's not possible to um, person a puppet for an entire week, but in terms of the load in and stuff, it took us, you know, a couple of days to get it all up and running. And it was, even when I listened to the audio from the film or I watched the video, that even like Jen coming out and saying, okay, you know, camera's ready, you know, go. Like it still feels like it's part of, of the piece. So there's a lot of tending, a lot of tasks um, that, there's some slippage between reality and the performance. And I would say that when I'm in there in the installation performing, I, I feel like I'm truly doing the thing that I'm doing. I'm, I'm not sort of like trying to look dramatically like I'm listening to these walls. I'm genuinely trying to sort out which wall goes where. So um, I think when people watch it, they'll have a, a sense of, yeah, all this like careful tending and observation and then hear this shifting soundscape as the walls move around and the bricks move around, which are the primary sound sources. Mm -hmm. well, well, and we should say that what you're presenting on Music for Your Inbox is a 20 minute segment of a durational performance. I think we did it for two hours at UC Irvine um, and yeah. we've done it longer. We did it at the Venda Museum. Uh, in February. And our plan is just whenever we have an opportunity to do it, we'll meet the parameters of that particular space and time, time, mm -hmm. you know, like if somebody wants us to do it for four hours, we would really love that. We might have to have some people cycle in and out. But, uh, the sense yeah. is that when you come in, it's been going on forever. And when you leave, it's going to keep going, even if that's not totally true. So yeah. this is this is a, a section, and actually, the the sort of script that we have, which is a task script that always changes, is in twenty mi minute segments, and so mm -hmm. kind of can be shuffled around and rearranged. But so it it represents a kind of what would you call it, like a chapter, an episode of the piece. Yeah, we were calling well, it like a shift, like a a worker's shift. shift. That's the word, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we have a worker, question. Kind of, so, Sorry. Go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, you know, we kind of settled on that 20 minute shift structure, which has a lot of the same components every time. Um, but because the, t the timings and the kind of combinations are happening differently every time, it's like, you know, Cassie, I don't know how many times you and I have like done those wall formations and the puppeteers have had to move from point A to point B. And it every time it, it feels very different and there's some new kind of problem solving that we have to do um well yeah it's also because the, go ahead cassie no 
I, I the, the tasks that, that are given to different uh, artists in the piece are open. So it might say, um, go over and put something at this station. So how they get there, you know, what they're doing there, it's all a little bit open to interpretation. You know, do um, a, a mundane activity. You know, so they could be writing in a notebook, they could be napping, they could be eating their lunch. So, you know, just it's it's not all, it's a kind of general directive for some of the tasks and specific for others. Mm. Well, we have a really interesting question from someone watching from Daria. Does the audience noise also get folded in? Which is interesting because you've, you've described this kind of slippage between like reality, when does it start, when does it stop? Um, do you feel a relationship with audience sounds as well? Well, there's a specific sound mode called feedback mode. I mean, amongst ourselves, where the microphones of the puppets are receiving sound and it's feeding back with the walls so in that sense it's quite literally integrated so if an audience member were to cough or sneeze or kick something or shuffle their feet that would be recorded and fed back into the system and through feedback and so we absolutely in fact that mode relies on extraneous sounds because if it were perfectly silent there would be no beginning of the feedback loop um so there, yeah, it's incorporated in it. But then, of course, if people are wandering around and we hear their footsteps and we would also hear the bricklaying and our footsteps, they're, yeah, absolutely integrated, but it's not, um, like, mandatory. And we don't ask, invite them, like, onto the set to participate. <laughs> but their they're sort of um, incidental sounds are incorporated into the soundscape. Well, it's really yeah. like a, a feeling of general activity in the space. So as people move around, that's all part of it. And like Cassie was saying, that the intensity of the sound in the room, it's like, and when the feed, when there's feedback happening, it's not like a one-to-one, -one, you're, you're not going to clap and hear your clap come back. But the overall intensity of the room and where things are happening will contribute to the shape of that sound. So it is, it's literally you know, um, joining every other sound in the space. In and, and the audience is moving freely around the perimeter of the space the whole time. So they're not just sitting or standing in one spot. Um, and so there, there is noise, there is sound going on. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, and with the audience, something I wanted to bring up for you to hear more from you guys about is this idea of surveillance and the, the idea of the observed observing and being observed um, in the context of having been really lucky to see a live performance of, of this of Soundhouse, which I really enjoyed. Um, that was really striking to me as an audience member that I was observing people who were very carefully observing each other and their tasks. And then this also video surveillance element of it where Janie, you were, you know, observing through the camera and uh, Shane Kwong was observing through her video art. Um, and I believe it was Tane that's doing projection that's getting kind of observed and processed. There's this constant, constant feeling of surveilling, observing surveillance. Um, and I was wondering if you guys, you guys could talk a little bit about that element of things and then also how you feel that a film version of this piece relates to this idea of like surveilling and uh, kind of another kind of third eye or fourth eye at this point, kind of observing this piece. Uh, well, I mean, kind of literally with the missile silos, there is a lot of surveillance. If someone is inside working, they have cameras all around the outside that they're watching, the, mostly like the silent landscape because they're in these incredibly barren places, but they would see it if somebody was coming toward the facility. And um, in terms of inside, I think there are a few cameras so that people in the outside world can also see the people in there. Um, but there's private spaces in there too. I don't think they're surveilled in their box. Um, mm. So that's kind of what started it. And then we were sort of fascinated with that montage of images that represented the outside and just started developing that. 
And then we did have in in one of the performances a, an overhead camera to well actually all the recent ones and we're projecting that on the one of the walls in the space so you're seeing the whole thing from above as you walk around and see the actual piece so it just seems to go with the nature of the work that mm. is sort of underpinning this but also just adding another layer of how we see um, just like perception and how we see any kind of event um, to add those different angles. I think there's also a big component uh, to a relationship to the audio feedback um, and that and, and just our interest in the manual labor and the mental labor um, in the various tasks that are in the piece and how productive or unproductive all those things are and at what point they're just kind of acting to sustain some kind of system um, or various systems that um, are structuring the piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and I'm really thought, excited about okay. this. Sorry, Jen. I'm excited about this video because we did have that camera above and, you know, we were able to capture the entire footprint of, or which is the blueprint of the whole missile silo. So for each performance, they're site specific. So we take the dimensions of the space and then we create a blueprint where technically speaking, the walls could build the entire thing. So if you were to time-lapse an overhead shot, you would see the walls and the bricks like actually building this structure that, that we've got as a blueprint. And then in this, in this version at UC Irvine, we had theatrical lighting, which was even more exciting um, because Xu Shen designed this, um, li like the lighting for it so that you can, it's sort of illuminated. You see the blueprint illuminated and then you'll see people building walls and then they'll take down the walls and then they'll move them elsewhere and then they'll bring them down or a bricklayer will build its sort of pseudo staircase or a missile in the missile room and then break it down. So that's something for me personally, it's something I've always wanted to see is sort of the like time lapse of the overhead camera and sort of see would this structure reveal itself you know if you were only watching that one camera so um yeah that's I, I know that the entire film won't just be the overhead camera but <laughs> <laughs> in my heart there's a video where that's all that yeah. happens <laughs> um well I, I want to say Shen Kuang CA's name because she designed all the video. I mean, mm. we both made video, but she designs the video in the space and she's a performer during mm. the entire performance, standing at the video station and mixing everything. And, and, and so instead of having like the booth be separate, we made that part of the tasks too. And she's completely integrated as a performer in the piece. So yeah, that's a really wanna... interesting distinction because you're right, you, you would normally, that person would be hidden off doing something mm -hmm. kind of behind the curtain or, um, but this is all kind of laid bare. This, these processes mm -hmm. are laid bare for people to see. Um, and along the lines of, um, you know, we talked a lot about the tending and the activity. As a viewer, it, as some, I think John, you kind of alluded to this earlier, it, it feels like both the work is important and pointless at the same time. Like there's this, this tension between like something that would just go on and on for ever being both important and like kind of mundane. Um, and I think this is like very, probably very relatable for a lot of people with certain tasks that we do in our own lives. So is, can you talk some about like, yeah, the piece's relationship to work. I mean, it's called Sound House. Everybody is working, or everyone is working. Excuse me. Um, what What are some of its relationships to, like, the you know, the, that tension in work? Well, I think we were really inspired by the missile silos for that part of it, where we were. I mean, this is the most important. I mean, Janie went and did some actual site visits and, and she did Shen a lot Kong, of research Shen Kong and I sorry, together. Shen yeah. Kong, yeah, yeah together and saw this sort of like it's the most important thing you know you could blow up countries with what you're doing I mean it's like incredibly important but at the same time the sort of minute to minute work of it is yeah napping and eating snacks it's and kind of boring like, <laughs> like clean the console again you know that kind of <laughs> sort of thing and it, it sort of reminds you 
you have those kind of like make work projects that governments have in certain countries where they're saying like, oh, well, your job is to mop this floor all day, even if the floor is perfectly clean. And so there's sort of this element of like, it's the most important thing. And yet it's, it's not important and, or not so much not important, but that it's mundane in its nature. Yeah. And, and the people, there was a woman we talked to at this missile museum who had been one of the people working underground because at a certain point they started allowing uh, female service members to work in the missile silos. And she, she said, you know, she felt a real sense of purpose about her work mm -hmm. because what they consider themselves doing is keeping us from making a mistake, um, kind of keeping, hoping that they never have to press the buttons. And there's a real fail safe kind of system of no one person can set off one of these missiles. There have to be two separate people and all these codes and phone calls and messages. Um, but really that she felt like it was actually very important work she was doing. Mm -hmm. Although of course we, we hope like we really didn't have to have this work going on you know, at all, but we do somehow underground have this. Well, and I think, sorry to cut you off. No, no, that was it. I was just gonna say, I think it's important to point out too that it, like it's not, it's not a cynical piece in terms of like, I, th I think where this piece started was from a genuine like enchantment with a lot of like, you know, manual labor and task performance, like the brick patterns, like, you know, just the operation of Janie's puppets is like enchanting. It's really um, beautiful. And, you know, with kind of, and then with like the geometrical structures we're exploring with like the walls and everything was a real, like just interest in how entrancing like that, is watching these kinds of um, tasks unfold. Um, but then there is like this question when it comes into there's the structural components, how all of this labor gets incorporated together, um, where they start to kind of rub against each other in different ways. And I think that that's kind of the, the ongoing exploration of the piece, the larger piece. Because it is like all these little pieces inside this, you know, I'm not going to say house. But, <laughs> you know. but you did, but you did. Yeah. <laughs> you did it. No. Yeah. no, it's 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 beautiful to experience in that way too, because as a viewer you can move in and you can widen and collapse your field of view of these like very detailed tasks. And we're really grateful to get to pre present it because it's a really special piece and um I'm mean, excited to see this like filmic version of it that kind of like layers on this different kind of like viewpoint surveillance um, aspect. Um, is there anything else you guys want to add before I wrap up or? Well, well I want to thank um, UC Irvine and Deborah Oliver and, um, for inviting us there, which gave us the opportunity to document the work in a much more aesthetic way than we'd been able to do before. And then I know when we had that documentation, it was good enough that, that this could happen. So we appreciate that. And it was part of the art of performance at their XMPL amazing theater there. So I just want to shout out to Deborah. Thank you. Yes, beautiful, yes, project. So thank you. And Ulysses thank Jenkins you. also was part of that selection. Um, so beautiful. for him too. Sorry. There, no, there I'm glad, thank you. There are a lot of performers and other people who have kind of lived with this project at different phases who, um, you know, are not involved every step of the way, but all of their work has been really invaluable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, film, the film will list the, the cast from the performance yes. too. So that's yeah. important. Yeah. 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 It's sort of hard to, I was even, you know, thinking today about how it's, it's hard to call it like my piece even anymore because there's, stuff that I don't even like the puppetry and I don't know how to do that <laughs> and there's these experts who are doing that and they um and at the end of the show they'll say like oh you know my wrist got tired from doing this particular <laughs> task a million times or something and you're thinking like oh yeah like there's a whole everyone's got their own little reality happening simultaneously and mm -hmm. we're all really really in close quarters and interacting with one another but we're not necessarily aware of the the exact specialization of each person and so mm -hmm. yeah it's I I would not want to miss anybody in the thank yous mm -hmm. but at the same time it's actually 
quite a huge list at this point with this many years of working on it. And it's just sort of a testament to like our community and all the mm -hmm. people supporting each other's work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for giving us the opportunity to share it on Music for Inbox. And thank um, you. yeah, it, it's going, if anyone would like to buy tickets, we have the link in our places and it will be <laughs> tickets will be available until November 15th and it will premiere on November 20th for on-demand viewing at people's homes. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your, your thoughts and artistry. We really appreciate it. Thanks, thank you, Jen. Jen. Thank you. <laughs> <All right>. Bye. <laughs> Bye.